On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks want to add a big man at some point, somehow. So I came up with three draft night trades the Mavs could pull off to get that big man that they want. And could Jake LaRavia be the do-it-all perfect role player wing for the Dallas Mavericks if they do keep their pick? We'll break him down. We'll talk about all this stuff on today's Lockdown Mavs. Let's go. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Lockdown Mavericks Podcast. Hey, hey, Dallas Mavericks are NBA champions. Don't believe you shouldn't be here. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making Locked On Mavs your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. But the best way to help us grow the show is to comment anything below. Let us know. Who do you want the Mavs to take in the draft? Do you want them to actually draft? Do you want them to trade? Do you like any of these three trades I'm going to show you? We'll, we'll, we'll break all that down. And joining me, as always, my co-host, writer, and contributor at Mavs.com, the Friday fiend, the one more thing king. What you got for me, Isaac Harris? All right, here's right, I'm going to talk directly to David Locke and Danny Ainge right now. Tell them. Stay away from Sean Sweeney. Get out. Stay away. Get He's away. He's a friend of the pod. He means too much to the Mavs. Stay away. Although, real quick caveat, Sean Sweeney, if you can get a head, co- head coaching job, super happy for you. Really proud for you. I don't know if selfish, I'd be happy for him. <laughs> I would be I would be happy for him. But as a selfish Ma- 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 Mavs fan, don't leave us. Please don't leave us. I don't know if I'd be happy for him. You know. I would. To be a head coach in the league, there's only... 30 of those jobs for sure no for sure uh yeah that was the rumor around around that but today we're going to get into three draft night trades and the one thing that we know that nico harrison has said over and over on you know during exit interviews on the eagle with ben and skin he is talked we'll have a seat at the table <laughs> the mavericks will have a dallas is going to get a seat at the table yes he said that he's talked about flexibility take a drink but the one thing that he said is that the mavericks want to add a big man mavericks want to add a rim protector a rebounder somebody to help them inside because you look at the points in the paint the mavs gave up against the warriors and then go look at what the warriors are doing against the celtics right now uh it's just it's a big difference. It, the Warriors dominated the Mavericks in the paint in the Western Conference Finals, and now the Warriors are getting absolutely smoked in the paint right now in the the finals. It's absolutely wild to see the difference. And so you start to think, okay, well, what if the Mavs played the Celtics? What would it look like? So they want to add a big man. I've got three draft night trades. Isaac did a couple of draft night trades yesterday, so go check out that podcast. And then I've got three draft night trades for the Mavericks to add a big man on draft night. If they want to trade the pick, if they want to trade a couple of assets and get a big man to bring into this rotation, um, I got some I got some trades for you. So let's start with the first one. Mm, Miles Mo Turner Bamba. has been the guy. <laughs> the trade for Mo Bamba is just, here's the mid-level exception. Take it and, and come play for the Mavericks. Orlando's like, do we match six million? <laughs> they got to decide. I mean, it's their decision. Miles Turner has been the guy I think can fit really well. There's some injury concerns. He's not the best role man, but he fills all the other gaps that the Mavericks want. The Pacers center is a really good rim protector. When he plays, he's been an incredible, he's one of, one of the top block guys in the NBA. He's been one of the top rim protectors in the game. He's been a guy that can step out on the perimeter and guard a little bit. He fits what the Mavericks need. And he's, he is, was at like every Mavericks playoff game wearing a cowboy hat on, on the sidelines. He was there. So this is the trade I think that the Mavericks could pull off for Miles Turner. Let's start with this. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it right there. The Mavericks would get Miles Turner and Buddy Heald. That's a lot of money coming in. But the Mavericks would send out Tim Hardaway, Dwight Powell, Trey Burke, Sterling Brown, and Josh Green. And the 26th pick. They would throw that out. Now, you're saying that doesn't sound like a lot. That is, that doesn't sound like the best assets to send to somebody. But they do get a first round pick. Miles Turner is an expiring contract. Buddy Heald's contract is not like the best. Him and Tim Hardaway kind of cancel out for me. And uh, Tim has one more year, so maybe the Pacers consider that as a negative asset. But we know Rick Carlisle likes Tim Hardaway Jr. and obviously he loves Miles Turner or he loves uh, Dwight Powell. So Indiana probably waves Sterling Brown and Trey Burke. Trey Burke would have to pick up his player option to do this. He he will. Probably. And he will, right? Because he's, he's, he, is he getting $3.3 somewhere else? Probably not. He's probably getting the minimum. 
Um, so Harp's like, wait, well, why? Wow. <laughs> Indiana would Indiana would trade would would waive Sterling Brown and Burke. They get the twenty six pick, so they get another young player to add to their collection. They're rebuilding. They get Dwight Powell and Tim Hardaway, like veteran guys to help bring these young guys along for Rick. And then the Mavericks obviously get Miles Turner. They replace Tim Hardaway's shooting with Buddy Heald's shooting. That Miles is on expiring deal, and they get these two guys. Isaac, what do you think about this as a trade? Yeah, so if you're Indiana, you're basically saying, all right, we'll swap out Buddy for Tim, yeah. and then it's it's basically a, a Josh Green and first for, for Miles Turner. Um, you know, because even Dwight's on an expiring deal. I mean, yeah, you get a rim roller in Dwight, but it's more about, hey, we have an expiring contract in Miles Turner. You get the 26 overall, a swing at Josh Green. And, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how Indiana – feel. I feel like we see different reports that Indiana just wants to keep Turner – and roll with it. They want a big that can protect the paint. Every reason why yeah, Dallas I, would want Turner, they want to keep him. Um, and it would make sense too. Um, who but, says no in this deal? Is, but, but we've also seen some unrest for Miles Turner too. It's not like he's like all happy to be there too. Like he has had some kind of deal. Did the bonus stuff change that though? Could have. Yeah, it could have. It, it could free it up, especially if they get somebody like a Keegan Murray to where now it's a it's a different type of four next to Turner. And it's like, all right, well, let him be the one one big down low instead of him and Sabonis for, you know, basically his whole career. So yeah. I don't I don't we don't know what he wants. Um, I think any big would welcome the opportunity to play with Luca. Like you said, he does struggle in, in the pick and roll yeah. a little bit. Um, you know, when you look at even his offensive you know, possession breakdown uh, compared to last year, 16, 16 percent of his um, offensive possessions last year as a, as a role man. Uh, and he was good in that, not not great, but you have to ask the question too of well, what great pick and roll guys has he been playing with <laughs> as far as pick and roll point guards? I'm I feel like we would all agree that put put Luke in the pick and roll with majority of bigs, he's gonna make their pick and roll numbers pretty decent. And like Miles Turner would be fine in the pick and roll. He's just not an yeah. elite pick and roll guy, right? So if you look at somebody yeah. that you want to pair, it's not like you're adding Rudy Gobert. You're not adding, you know, some of these other guys that just be elite in a pick and roll where that that all, all, all of a sudden becomes the best thing the Mavericks can do on offense. Yes. And so, and I'll point out this and then I'll, I'll go on the po- positives on it is I've some people I think will throw out there of like, Hey, pick and pop miles Turner. He can knock down the threes. He can. So, so last year unguarded catch and shoot shots. He was 34% from the field um, it was a below average rating on synergy when it just comes to catch and shoot shots. Now, can that average go up? Will he, will he get more open shots playing with like a Luka Doncic, something like that? Probably so. And But the question you ask yourself in a trade like this is, will Miles Turner be the best center that Luka has played with? <laughs> I mean, but that that's the question you ask. He played like, with DeAndre Jordan. He played with... <laughs> but but you take... If, if that trade theoretically happened, yeah. then yes, you're swapping out Tim for Buddy and all of that. But also you're adding Miles Turner... The, the upgrade from a, a Dwight Powell to a Miles Turner, I think it's a, a pretty dang. I, it's not a, it's not a perfect fit. I'm not sitting here saying Miles Turner is a perfect fit in Dallas, but it's a good fit in Dallas. To where if you could pull off and get a Miles Turner, I think you got to swing for it because I, I, he would clearly be the best center that Luca has played with. And the whole thing about this is not offense; it's defense. It's getting, it's yeah, it's shoring up the the inside for the Mavericks. It's getting a guy in there that can deter anyone from the rim. I mean, nobody was deterred for the rim, from the rim from the Mavericks unless they were just stopped on the perimeter. And so it's giving those wings a break. It's giving those guys somebody to funnel to. It's, you know, it's giving you another option. And yeah, it gives you a pick and pop guy, right? It gives you a guy that can still spread the floor and can def- can hold his own and defend in spaces. And, and he's expiring. Like that's, true. that's huge. Like I, I think it might change it a little bit for me if you're saying, hey, he's under contract for three more years, still do about 75 mil, does, it's like, oh, well, I don't... Does I don't it make that. it worse that he's expiring, though? Because what if it's a one-year, it doesn't work, he's still yeah. mad, he doesn't get shots, you gave up the 26th pick, like, you gave up some stuff, and... That you, doesn't change, no. It wouldn't change anything for you? No. Would because you, it, you're not trading the 10th overall pick, you're trading the 26th. You're already taking a swing. Yeah. And a guy like Josh Green was barely playing in your rotation at all, you know, coming to the playoffs. So, it's like... Yeah, that doesn't worry me about expiring. We asked um, Tony East from Locked On Pacers about this exact, basically this exact deal um, at, for our ultimate mock draft, and he turned it down. He said that he didn't think that it would be worth it uh, to get the 26th pick, and he, he saw that he thought that that Miles Turner and 
Um, did we ask? Did we ask him for a pick? I can't remember, but he said it just wouldn't be worth it. He didn't see Tim Hardaway Jr. and Dwight Powell playing on the on the Pacers very much because um, they're trying to develop some young guys. Didn't see a reason for them to do that. Didn't see a value in the twenty six pick. And basically, it came down to do I value Miles for him? It came down to do I value Miles Turner as the twenty six pick? And he said no. And so he would, he would want a higher yeah. pick for Miles Turner. So that's what it, it came it, down to for him. And I I got that. And so maybe the Pacers think, think for, the same way. I think for a trade like this to happen or a framework of it, you need two things from Dallas and Indiana, or basically two things from the Indiana side. You would need in, you need Miles Turner to basically tell them, hey, I, I want to go elsewhere. I'm not going to come back after this year. Take me around. home. And and road. I think you would I think you would also need Rick Carlisle saying, Hey, I want to add some vets, these yeah. two vets and Tim and Dwight that I know are great around young guys Super to this young guys. core. Halliburton, they're going to have a, the six overall pick. They get, have some other guys. So Get Buddy healed out of my life. <laughs> That's what Frank would have to say, too. Buddy and Miles are like, we already work out in Dallas. Let's go. Let's I know, go. right? They both do. Um, so there you go. That's one of the trades. Let us know what you think about it in the comments. Coming up, I got two more. One of them is for Clint Capella. How do the Mavs get Clint Capella? Could the Mavs pull that trade off? Because I think that Clint Capella fits a little bit even better than Miles Turner. So we'll talk about that coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about Bet Online. It's the best place to check out the odds and lines and spreads in sports. The NBA Finals are raging on. The Celtics won game three in kind of convincing fashion. Celtics right now, minus 220 favorite. The Warriors are plus 190 now. So they, they're giving the Celtics more of a, of a bump. Game four, Celtics at home, Isaac Harris. What's the spread? Um, I'm going to say... Um, Guess the line. Minus five. Minus four for the Celtics. Nice one. Hmm. There's a lot of other stuff there. They have props. They have lines. They have uh, series games right now. If you, you want to bet seven games, that's plus four, uh, 140. Six games is plus 130. Five games is plus 300. You can bet all that kind of stuff. Check it all out. They also have WNBA stuff. They have uh, baseball. They have all kinds of things you can check out. Fights, everything. Check it out at Bet Online. It's where the game starts. All right, Isaac Harris. Thanks for making Lockdown Mavs your first listen every day. We got a special favor to ask of you guys, the Lockdown Mavs, the Lockdown Podcast listeners. We want to know what you think about our shows. Go to LockedOnPodcasts.com slash survey to fill out a survey right now to tell us what you think about Locked On. We also will give you, uh, you'll qualify to win one of $1,000 Ticketmaster gift cards. If you want to go to a game, go to, you know, Rangers game, Wings game this summer, Mavs game next year, whatever you want to do, check it out. LockedOnPodcasts.com slash survey. All right, Isaac Harris, I got a couple more trades for you. I said the next one was going to be about Clint Capella, and it is. It's a three-teamer. We've kind of batted this one around a little bit. But here it is. I'm going to throw it up on the screen on YouTube. Um, Pretty simple here. Mavs get Clint Capella. The Atlanta Hawks, caca, get Rudy Gobert. And the Jazz would get Danilo Gallinari's expiring, 21 million. Dinwiddie, 19.5. Josh Green, the first round pick from the Mavs, number 26, and the first round pick from the Hawks, number 16, in the draft. So they get two picks. They get Josh Green, they get Dinwiddie, and they get the expiring of Danilo Gallinari. They're basically starting over. So Utah kind of blows it up a little bit, like a, like a soft blow up, right? Like they're not fully blowing it up. They're like, we got to get Rudy Gobert away from Donovan Mitchell. Oh, uh, that's kind of a blow up, though. My, I think if they're really going like backwards. I think it's a good I think it's a good deal because you're getting the two first. Yeah. But I wonder if they would want a better no shot at Dinwiddie here, but I wonder if they would want a better centerpiece coming back like a better win now player right now. But yes, that's a that's a good framework. So, but they get the two first, they get green, they get cap flexibility with with Gallinari. Din, Dinwiddie's yeah. only on a two-year deal too, so they got, they have some cap flexibility with him too if they want to try something later. Um, the Hawks, why would they do this? They give up a first-round pick in Gallinari to upgrade from Clint Capella to Rudy Gobert. That is a, a pretty huge upgrade for them. If they want to just go all in on Trey Trey Young and Rudy Gobert, like, hey, we got to cover up this guy, this this point guard on, that on, on, on defense. And so they're like, okay, we're, we'll just get the best one there is. If it doesn't work with Trey Burke and, or Trey Young and uh, Rudy Gobert, then it's not going to work with Trey Young in any center. So you got to try a different yeah. way. 
And then the Mavericks gave up Dinwiddie. That one, that one hurts. And the first round pick, but they get Clint Capella, and they didn't give up any of the wings. They didn't give up, you know, any of the center rotation. So you still have a couple other things you could do. Plus, Clint Capella would be incredible for the Mavericks. Isaac, you've been all over Clint Capella as like this is probably the ideal center if the Mavericks could go out and get one. Ideal in the sense of I think you can get him at a cheaper cost, like something you you just laid out. Then like a Rudy Gobert of like, hey, could you pay? Do you have Capella's you know ac- exact contract number in front of you? Um, uh, he's get. I can I can pull it up. But like you're, it's nowhere near what Rudy's making. No. So, but what you're asking from the center spot as a rim roller, his rim rolling numbers are great. He's literally one of the best rebounders in all of basketball. Capella is making 19.7 next year, 22.1 the next year after that, 23.7 that final year, and they're all guaranteed. So that that's like a that's an ideal <laughs> like salary for a really good starting center in the NBA. Yeah. So half the cost from a Rudy Gobert. Yeah. And he's great at rim rolling. He's great. Yeah. You know, he can like he's playing above the rim. He's going to catch a lob and all of that. He's he's a heck of a rebounder, and he can defend in the paint. Now. His, his health is a little question mark for me. He did play in 70-something games last year, 74 games last year. But the year before that, was 63. year before that, 39. But we're also getting to... Well, you know, last COVID. year, they only played 72 games. So he only missed eight last year. 20. Okay. 20, yeah, 20, 20, nine, yeah, nine games. Yeah. yeah. And then the year before that, it was obviously COVID, bubble, all of that. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I Capella is, I feel like, is the... Like, Rudy Gobert is, like, up here... But like for half the cost for what you would ask at that center spot, Clint Capella could give you a lot of that. And that's a very interesting trade. If you ask the question, like who says no in that trade, it, I want to lean Utah. It would have to be Utah because it because Utah is the one where you're like, okay, they only agree to do this type of a deal if the it's so toxic with Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. The new coach they bring in is just not sold on Rudy Gobert and says, look at this. How many years in a row do we have to keep running this thing back where he just gets pulled out of the paint in the in the playoffs and it just doesn't work? And so we want to try try again. And could they I guess they with a deal like this, they couldn't take the two picks and go go package them with like, you know, something else like Bogdanovich or something else to get a star and like a, to bring in a star. They just couldn't do that because the Mavericks can only trade these picks if they're making a pick and then they give that player basically to yeah you know to the jazz they're they're basically drafting for the jazz i'm doing air quotes for everyone on the podcast and so you, they couldn't take those picks and package them for something else but they get two young players and maybe us like a soft rebuild around donovan mitchell if donovan mitchell is like i'm down for this um, or they know that Donovan Mitchell is like done and they say, okay, this is our soft rebuild. We're starting with this. And then around free agency, we'll do the Donovan Mitchell trade and just do a full blow up. Um, so that's the only way that the jazz would do this. I think is you just a, don't know what Rudy Gobert's trade value. Is. I don't that's the, I think that's one of the biggest things of, I mean, they can make a trade for Rudy and it's a deal like this, or they could trade Rudy somewhere. And we're sitting there saying, dude, they really got three first. And, and a young this, player, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and a young player, and then a good like a decent yeah, they got, player, and they that, got Lou like, Dort and three first round picks from the the Thunder. Like what? Yeah, I just don't. We just don't know what it is. So, so yeah, so that's the the Clint Capella trade. The last one I have is a little bit of a smaller one, but I think this one could this one could could work out pretty well for the Mavs. Uh, Here's Mo Bamba. Kind of, kind of got Mo on ball, and the last one here is uh, Rashawn Holmes, the center for mm-hmm. the Sacramento Kings. The uh, Dallas Mavericks would get Rashawn Holmes and they get the number 37 pick and the number 49 pick. The Mavs would send out the 26th pick, Josh Green, Sterling Brown, and Trey Burke to make the, the cap work. The Kings could could keep Sterling Brown and Burke or waive them if they want to, but the Kings would add 26, so they move up. They package their two picks together, move up from, from 37 and 49 to get the 26th pick, and then they uh, can take... I guess they could take whatever player they get at 26 with number four with with number four and green and maybe get a win now player because that's reportedly what the Kings want to do is take number four in this draft and get a win now player. Uh, Rashawn Holmes kind of fell out of the rotation with you know the Demata Sabonis trade. They weren't they didn't play those guys together b- barely at all, and so he's kind of out of it. And so the Mavs get a center. the The Kings get another like young player that they could add to their core or another asset that they can use to make it to add to another trade. Cause I don't know if for Sean Holmes, that asset, I don't know if those second round picks are another asset like that. And so it's just kind of interesting all around. 
No, I, I think this is a this is a deal that I'm like really a, a type of deal that I would be looking at the most if I was Dallas is how can you take on the player, move back? We talked a little bit yesterday about OKC packs and both picks and move up or Orlando yeah. or, you know, another. We talked about uh, New Orleans doing a similar trade to this of Larry Nance and their second round pick to move up to 26. Similar package if if the Kings, the framework of it is, you know, Holmes, one of those for or one of those second or both of the seconds to move up to 26. You know, like you said yesterday is the only thing about this is Mark willing to pay the tax for Rashawn Holmes, like more in the tax, you know, for Rashawn Holmes. To take well, he's on. only he's only giving up. Let's see. You make the salaries work like you're only adding one point eight million dollars to your salary. And so that's the only like extra mm tax that you would bring. And plus, the difference between the first round pick and the two second round picks, if you keep those two second round picks, I, I don't, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but it could be about equal to that or... Yeah, that's true. It could be about that. And so you're not really adding too much more because you're you're sending out Burke and Brown and Green who are making $3 million each. So uh, yeah. I don't know if you're adding too much to the tax, but you you get Rashawn Holmes, you add him to that, to that lineup and... He's obviously he comes in and is better than Dwight Powell. He's got that floater. He's a really good rim roller. Uh, can defend the rim. He's not as good as the other two guys at defending the rim, but he can better than the two guys the Mavs have now. And he's at eleven point two next year, twelve after that, and then he has a player option in twenty twenty four twenty five for twelve point eight. So it's not the it's end nice. of the world. He would be a bullpen type of center though. So like the, maybe maybe one of the things that you would you could say against it if you had to say that is is he redundant to dwight in the sense of all right well if we're going to add another guy in the bullpen in the center rotation would you want a bigger body but rashawn home and, and i would say to that <laughs> if luka don just can make dwight powell look like the way he did imagine what he could do with rashawn holmes because rashawn holmes has been playing with De'Aaron fox and the point guards yeah. that they have down in sacramento for his whole career here i like Holmes. that that's a that's a good trade i like that yeah, so there you go. That's three trades. Let us know what you think about them, about the three centers. Uh, I'm sure you guys let us know in the comments below. But coming up, they already have. let's talk about Jake LaRavia, the wing from Wake Forest. Really interesting prospect. He's kind of a do-it-all guy, so we'll break, in, break it all down coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about Sakara. Looking and feeling your best shouldn't mean deprivation. Instead, choose joy. Oh, my gosh. I haven't heard that phrase in so long. Choose joy in abundance. Sakara's organic, plant-based, transformational nutrition programs are designed to help you cultivate body intelligence so you nourish your body and experience the results that you want. Sakara is a wellness company anchored in food as medicine on a mission to nourish your body through the power of plants. They have all these different programs. They sent us a box with a meal plan where it's like, okay, this is your breakfast for the day. This is your lunch for the day. This is your snack you get for the day. And sometimes I like that structure because I deal with, okay, I don't know what I want to plan for my meals. I got to make sure it's healthy, all that. They got you covered. And all the stuff that, that me and my wife ate, were delicious. They have powerful plant rich rich ingredients, boosting energy, supporting your digestion, curving your sugar craves, keeping your skin glowing. That's huge. Mm. My wife is like giving me all these like face creams and stuff and is saying, yeah, we gotta we're getting into our 30s, so we gotta <laughs> help our face. This is what helps. Right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to Sakara.com slash locked on 20. They don't just have meal plans, they also have snacks, they have different things, they have one-offs that you can go buy. It's Sakara.com slash locked on 20. S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash locked on 20. Locked on the number 20. Get 20% off your first order with Sakara. All right, Isaac Harris, we're moving on to our next draft profile. It's Jake LaRavia, a 6'8 wing from Wake Forest, 227 pounds. He measured a 6'9 and a half inch wingspan, age 20 at the draft. The one sentence descriptor for him, he's a versatile forward with a strong frame, great feel, increasingly reliable jump shot who worked, uh, who ranked as perhaps the most pleasant surprise among all up transfers this season for Wake Forest. Highly skilled player who makes his teammates better with passing, cutting, and defending. Shout out to NBA.com. Uh, they have Synergy. They have all kinds of these draft profiles that are great, as well as the ringer for those. Couple of couple of strengths and weaknesses. He kind of can just do everything on offense. Like he can, like if you look at his highlight reels, he catches a bunch of lobs from players. And so he's got a little bit of athleticism that he can catch that. He was a solid, like spot up shooter. He can, he can, you know. Catch, he can catch and shoot. He doesn't necessarily do it off the dribble, but he can dribble in the paint. He can finish at the rim. He can attack a closeout. 
He's a really good passer. Um, you know, he can you can pass the flow of the ball. And he did an interview with uh, Rafael Barlow from Lockdown NBA Big Board. Go check it out on their YouTube channel. He did an interview and said, quote, I'm the perfect role player. <laughs> That's what he said. Like, I am the perfect role player. And on offense, you can see that. Defensively, you know, he's uh, NBA.com said he's hard-nosed on the ball defender with the versatility to defend multiple positions. He's not like a frail wing either. Like, he's pretty. he looks pretty strong. Can hold yeah. his own. He proved to be a very good team defender last season, uh, and he's just got some some good strengths there. And a little bit of versatility on pretty much everything. Yeah. So Laravia goes to the combine, and he's one of these guys that gets invited. He actually goes. He's gonna, you know, actually do some you know, some drills and stuff. And he's one of the unique dudes who does a few. He does a few drills, and then whoop, shuts it down. And you're like, all right, we know what this means. So I, I was reading about. I was reading about why he shut it down at the combine. So he, he goes there. He leads all prospects at the combine in three-point star drill. He hit 68% of his shots in that drill, 17 of 25 around the arc. He also mm. finished second in the shuttle run and third in lane agility. And he's like, all right, agent steps in, says, hey, you need to shut this down. Hey, man, I know. man I'm, just, I'm just telling you, that I don't know if it's, <laughs> it's going to get better than this. Yeah, it's like, I don't know what uh, teams are saying right now. Uh, but You showed but everything what, you need to show. But what he said about being the the perfect role player, I that I wrote down. I was like, um, I said high, high floor, low ceiling. I think he's yeah. like I don't see him as a star, but I, I don't see a way. I mean, and once again, could be wrong. In this I just don't see a way in like he fails in the league. I think he's he. <laughs> I, like what what type like he was 40 percent on spot up shots some people consider him like w- literally one of the best shooters in the draft but you also look at some of his percentages too and you're like all right like has he always been that because he's a transfer so he started at indiana state transfers <laughs> to wake forest and his shooting numbers hasn't always been there but this past year he shot 38 percent from three like i said 40 percent on spot up shots so he definitely improved in that he just has he has to feel the game he's just a I know it sounds really dumb and cliche. He's just a really good all-around player at 6'8", who can do a little bit of everything. I do worry a little bit about like what you ask of him. Yep. He's I don't like him in like shot creation. I don't like him like, hey, let's just let's run pick and roll, ISO it out type of thing, go get a bucket. I don't like that. But could he be a three a version of a three and D guy off the bench who could also put on the floor a little bit? Possibly. His athleticism is a little bit like mm. Like yeah, some of his speed is looked a little slow sometimes. If you're gonna talk about some weaknesses, like yeah, the lack of length, he, he only got a six nine wingspan, so it's not like he's got this. Like we we talked about uh, Tari Eason, who was s- same height, they measured it exactly six eight. Tari Eason's got a seven two and a half wingspan, and Laravia's yeah, got yeah. a six nine and a half, a five inch different of a, of a wingspan. Like that's a lot, uh, and that's what the that's what the elite defenders have is that really long wingspan, and so that is sort of holding them back. The lateral quickness is kind of holding them back in matchups defensively. Um, he doesn't have a reliable, like you said, he doesn't have a reliable shot off the dribble. He's kind of limited as a ball handler. That's one thing that he told Rafael in that interview with NBA Big Board that if he's got to improve, it's his ball handling. He said sometimes I had turnovers that were just me, that were just me making a, a bad decision, dribbling into traffic and all that. So he's got to get better at that. And then he's just not a primary shot creator at, at this point. So, so you're not asking him to, like, I don't even know if you're asking him to, okay, come off the bench and run this second unit, right? No. Like, I don't know if you would ask him to do that on the next level. No. No, but but could he come off the bench and be a 3 and D guy and say, hey, hit some shots, you know, switch off. He yeah. can't switch off on some guys. It's not like he's just getting blown past. Like, he's a versatile defender. I wrote down two names for him, for me. Com- comps? Yeah. Yeah, I got some. Um, two... Two guys from France. Wow. Nick, Nick Batum and Boris Diaw. I like the well, yeah, I like That's the Boris Diaw on. one. The Boris B- Diaw's a, a little smaller, I think, as far as height wise. Um, but yeah, just I, I started off with Nick Batum in the sense of bigger guy. He basically playing that three and D role. Yeah. You're not you're not running ISO plays for Nick Batum. Nope. Batum's probably he's probably a better defender, but just that type of frame and what you ask of Batum. Anyway, the ringer had a great one. This is like when, as soon as I saw this, I was like, Oh, how did I not think of this? Kyle Anderson, your nemesis, my guy. And then it, like, it's, it's perfect. It's that guy that can give you a little bit of passing, like a little bit of shot creation, a little bit of this. He's like, can do it all, but uh, he's like, got kind of no weaknesses in his game. Yeah. But he's a little, not- little bit taller too. I think Kyle Anderson's like six, five, six, six. 
Could be wrong. No, I think, anyway, he's, I think he's bigger than that. Uh, the yeah. other one that stood out to me, like if he's going to excel at a couple things in the NBA, was Gordon Hayward. I could just see that as a, a, a wing that can score. Like he can he can hit sh- some shots off the dribble. He can you know he can score here and there. He was asked to score a lot at Wake Forest, which is kind of a weird thing for him because he was he was a transfer. He like he transferred up conferences. Yeah. He came from the Missouri Valley Conference then to to Wake Forest, and he was asked to do more at Wake Forest. So it was kind of a weird situation for him. And they did well. They did well. And they did well. He had incredible games against Duke and UNC. Like he had like a 31 point game against UNC where he was like finishing post moves around, around UNC. Who's the guy with the hair at UNC? Baycott? No, your your guy, the white guy that with the hair. Oh, Manic. Manic. Yeah, he was like he was like finishing like post moves and, and hooks over him and stuff. You're like, what is happening? Like, what is what is this guy doing? Um, but yeah, if 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 he excels at a couple of things, other guys I thought of was like uh, Bojan Bogdanovic, Joe Ingles, and then sort of like mm-hmm. a less athletic but stronger and less uh, high intensity of a shooter, Brandon Ingram. Like, because Brandon Ingram's kind of got that mm. the 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 dribble is not completely there, but he can shoot, but he can do a bunch of different little things. He's a better passer than people expect, and like all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure he's going to be the star that Brandon Ingram is, but yeah. like that style of a player. Um, Oh, uh, availability. Rafael has him as a first rounder now. He's he rose up his draft board. The first time Rafael sent me a big board, he had him at like 55. And then as he watched more of him and saw more of his workouts, and he actually flew out. If you watch that interview, he's sitting there with him in person. He flew out and saw some of his workouts and got to to see more of him. And he has him as a first rounder now. The ringer had him at 31. ESPN mocked him at 32. And then the athletic has him at 28. So he's he's probably going to be available for the maps unless he stopped the workouts because he got a promise somewhere. Yeah. And uh, that is in the first round. But. Because I think he's a he's a good player for good teams. Yeah. Like he's he's not a swing. He's not a big swing. When we talk about the Jaden Hardy, like you're swinging for yes. a guy like that. I've been doing a lot of work on Patrick Baldwin. Like you're swinging on Patrick Baldwin. You're you're guessing on, you're taking a swing on a lot of early high school stuff with Baldwin. But like Laravia is not a swing because I think he it's almost a, like it feels like it's almost a lock that dude, just mark this thing in. He's going to be a role player for like eight years in the NBA. And if you're a really good team in the 20s there that's been to the playoffs this postseason, you're saying, oh, LaRavia, this guy can step in and, you know, give me 10 minutes off the bench in a postseason he can play. game. Yeah, yeah he, can, he can play in the playoffs. So it, it's one of those picks where it's like, hey, whoever takes him, I think you're sitting there saying, solid pick, going to be in the rotation. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how he fits in. You're not, you know, you're not going to the airport to greet him as oh. he comes in with posters. That's so, what we but, should. That's what we should add to these profiles. Is uh, what would they say on draft night? Like, what would the analysts say on draft night if the Mavs picked this player? Uh, I think that's a good. That's a good one. We should add to this. Well, we ha- it depends on what analyst. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it Kendrick Perkins? This is a terrible pick. Um, why the Mavs should take him pick? and why they shouldn't take him, which is kind of what the analysts say. Um. They should take him. They're betting on the skill set will translate to the next level, that he would be a perfect role player that can play next to anyone and fill a bunch of holes. Whatever you want in your lineup. Like he can play, he can he can move up and play four. Like there are lineups, and if you're playing small, he could be like your five. And like if you're playing against a really yeah, small I mean, team. Six, six, he's six, seven, six, eight. Yeah, whatever. he's six, eight with, you know, uh, so he can do that. And he's like, he'd be that perfect role player. Why they shouldn't take him? The athleticism doesn't carry over to the next to the next uh, level in the NBA, which limits his defense. His handle, which he already admits is a, a weakness for him, limits him offensively, and then his shot just isn't good enough. Because if those two things don't work, if the defense and the handle don't work for him, then all of a sudden you're like, okay, what are you? You're, are you a spot up shooter? Okay, well if your spot up shooting isn't good, then all of a sudden like, what are you in the NBA? Uh, and so it's, I think it's those three things that really have to carry over, like the athleticism, the handle, and the shot. Yeah, so if they really believe in the shot, you say, why do we take them? They they take them because they're saying, all right, could we get a, a more mobile, better defending Davis Bertans in Laravia? Of, you know, Bertans is 6'10", but yeah, it's like... Not, hey, as, not as good of a shooter, though, I don't think. No, but that's what I'm saying. If you think he is that good of a shooter, I mean, he goes to the yeah, combine, the com- and does all these combine shooting numbers drills, right. and then he, he's out, and then you talk to the people, and they're like, hey, he's one of the best shooters in the draft. If they think he's that good of a shooter... Then you're like, all right, he's more mobile in Bertans. We see in Bertans' role. Can we throw him in that type of role and he'd be a little bit better? Why you don't take him is maybe you want to bet on another guy in that range that has an excellent skill. Yeah. You want to take a, a swing at a bow champ because, hey, we know he's an el- elite, elite defender prospect at you know defense. 
let's let's take the swing at the shot compared to a higher floor, lower ceiling guy in a Laravia. So both of them would be solid. There's not many wings. In, I mean, spoiler alert here. There's not many wings in this range that I'm going to say, no, I'm out. I'm out yeah. on them <laughs> because I, I'm down for swings at, at wings. And it looks like there's going to be a team, a playoff team that's going to take a swing at Laravia <laughs> in the first round. I've seen some comments on YouTube that say, you guys are so out on Josh Green and yet you'll take another swing on these wings. Like, yeah, man, that's what you do in the draft sometimes. Um, so like, hey, let's just, let's just bring in another wing. You can never get enough of these guys. We're going to keep talking about them. Um, yeah. Yeah, and just because we say we want to draft one of these guys doesn't mean we're done with Josh Green either, right? Like, no, no. But I mean, so when when you ask the question, when I ask the question, is he better than Josh Green right now? I'm asking more about that rotation. The rotation, spot. yeah. Because we went to the conference finals, and it's like, man, we need another body off the bench. Whether Josh is on the team or not, can we get an eighth guy? Like, can we get another guy, yeah. an eighth man, a ninth man in this rotation that were like, hey, we trust you in a series. Like we're seeing Otto Porter log some minutes for the Warriors in the finals. Like, can can a Laravia be an Otto Porter and give us some minutes like that in a in a playoff series compared to we love Josh, but like Josh seemed just scared at times. And it was like, what what's yeah. Josh's elite skill that he's on the floor for outside of like passing or something? So anyway, that's why we asked. That's why I asked yeah. that question. There you go. That's Jake Laravia profile. That's a couple of trades. Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for making Lockdown Mavs your first listen every day. Make your second listen Lockdown NBA today. Go check it out with Wes and Adam Mares. Great stuff all the time. I host the episode on Thursday, so you haven't listened to that. Go listen to that. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Lockdown Mavs. Peace out. Boom.